final workshop today will be hosted by Yusha. Uh, you is a machine learning engineer with a passion for forecasting, uh, building better models, and solving real world problems with accuracy and interpretability. She graduated from NYU with a joint major in mathematics and data science, where she honed her skills in statistics, machine learning, and optimization. Her workshop today is on probabilistic programming 101. And as a student of statistics, uh, this workshop is especially close to my heart. Uh, you is going to uh, stop in the interim to take questions. You, over to you. Uh, welcome to its workshop and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for the warm introduction. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, just a machine learning engineer from Bank Global Engineering Team. Uh, I'm going to share the slide and hope have fun. Hope, hope you guys could have fun with the workshop. I want to say it's my honor uh, be a, to be a speaker today in the uh, foundation of data science workshop series today hosted by Wiz and talk about probabilistic programming. Um, I want to kind of uh, set up the tone that instead of just focusing on the theoretical side of this topic itself, I also want to introduce uh, some practical like with interactive code example and also introduce my way to figure out this probabilistic programming as an important tool to solve it, like a key technical difficulties in like an IP project I'm working on. Uh, Internally, we call retail marketing digital twin, also known as Redmar. And I hope this story behind saying is interesting to you guys and could review some like inspiration of the reason we apply probabilistic programming. Um, also, I want to say if you have any uh, questions throughout the way, feel free to drop them anytime during the chat, and I will try to answer related ones during breaks uh, between sections. Cool. Let's then jump to like an introduction of uh, the, the team page. I really want to introduce this uh, because uh, it's in the like a collaborative effort that brings not just only the team members from Bang, but also a professor from NYU, Professor Zhong Yuan Zhou. Uh, we have a large group of passionate professionals with extensive experience um, in data-driven marketing. Um, so they're have an extensive experience when it comes to applying machine learning techniques to recommendation optimization, uh, personalized customer marketing solution, demand forecasting, I guess, et uh, Without the team, I should say, will not have sufficient capability construct Renmar, nor like the opportunity for myself to explore probabilistic programming. So thanks for um, gathering this team together. Um, Cool. Without further ado, let's jump to a quick introduction of probabilistic programming. Uh, this is the only page uh, that's like full of the text that try to do some definition and concepts. So please bear with me just like, a, let's just understand first what is probabilistic programming. Um, as it's its core, it, probabilistic programming allow us to represent the data generation process directly through the codes. So this means we can model the measurement process, including their imperfections and the inherent uncertain, uncertainty they entail. Um, the philosophy behind it is simple, that we try to claim um, or we, we try to capture the essential aspects of real world process in a model and try not to torture the data into the right format for an algorithm. So basically you can understand a logic that how, if you are the like the one in the game, how will you make the decision? How would you uh, model the process? And that's exactly what prob probabilist programming uh, would like to do. So the way um, that we could build this kind of code is through two ways, like, or actually there are multiple approaches, but there are uh, mainly two ways. One is like deploying a domain specific language uh, along with compiler or interpreter. So for example, Sting, or you could also utilizing a library or framework tailored for an existing language. For example, like PyMC3, TensorFlow Probability, and NumPyro. Um, so what are these choices in common? 
Firstly, they incorporate uh, random choices as a native element. And second, they maintain a clear separation between the probabilistic modeling and the inference so that we can focus on uh, each aspect independently or optimize them accordingly. And lastly, uh, they provide the capability for automated generation of inference solution and could allow us for like efficient analysis. So on the right here, I attach a small sample uh, of the probabilistic uh, programming code uh, written in STEN. So you can see here, uh, you could simply define uh, your data here, your parameter, and also your model. So in this example, we have relative, relative simple one uh, with a prior defined as a beta distribution and a Bernoulli distribution uh, as a likelihood. So you can see here, every component is clearly defined, defined and declared. Um, and what we need to do is connect them uh, or connect them into like a model as a kind of uh, claimation statement here. Besides then again, we have a lot of more tools to use. And for this, today's section, we'll uh, use NumPyro in the interactive code example, just because from my personal experience, I found it uh, relatively easier to uh, have the first example run. Cool. Um, we already know what is probabilistic programming. And the next question naturally would be, how could we fit such a tool um, in the digital twin? Um, so to answer this question, I kind of want to first explain a little bit what is digital twin. Like in the retail marketing scenario, I'll just focus on this uh, industry specifically. Like the retailer is trying to apply like any potential marketing strategies to enhance uh, customer loyalty, increase customer lifetime value and so on. But it's also like a kind of cost burden to the retailer to really apply those marketing strategies, right? So finding that balance between the effective strategy uh, across channels and um, the variable cost becomes like a topic with extensive discussions. And to fully understand the effect of applying a strategy where essentially answer one question or studying one question, which is how each customer will react to a collection of marketing strategy. So then on the left-hand side, we'll have two parties involved in that question, right? The first one is the marketing channel or any kind of promotion strategy we have, which usually the retailer knows a lot about and have control of. Like for example, by setting up menu, uh, optimize a uh, promotion strategy, for example, just like 10% off uh, across the market, or we could apply any, um, uh, smart uh, policy by extensive data analysis. Well, the other part of the question is the user interaction, like how user will react to those. This is a part we usually could know just a little about from like data analysis. However, if we could uh, build an accurate customer behavior model that could extrapolate such an interaction correctly for any scenario, we'll have a like a robust digital twin to model the real world environment, right? And the fantastic thing is like, then we could use this environment as a playground to evaluate the performance of any marketing strategies that the retailer want to test. Even more interesting uh, is kind of on the right-hand side that we could, uh, add a smart AI agent to optimize the marketing strategy. And um, for example, uh, it could like the AI agent could propose some like, strategy that maybe the human could not really understand any first step, for first um, site, but we could run millions or thousands of those uh, simulations in the environment and to test the effects and verify the efficiency of that strategy. So this is the main idea of developing a digital twin so that we could draw confident conclusion on um, some optimization problem and um, with some business application in sales forecasting, budget allocation, and so on. 
uh, well, you can see the left hand side here then is our current status or usually the current status that to build like predicted uh, predictive insights while the right hand side is our ideal product to provide more prescriptive insights and suggest optimal marketing strategies. Well, the place I want to highlight that uh, probabilistic programming could fit in is the way that we construct the environment. Um, uh, we could construct the, construct the environment probabilistically because every purchase decision made by the customer involves some degree of uncertainty. And that's exactly the pay, uh, place that would fit in this tool. Cool. I kind of mentioned a little bit about the high level uh, component of the environment, but I also want to dive in a little bit to our the work we're uh, currently implementing. Um, I should admit that marketing strategy is quite a large topic with many possible optimization target. And our team decide to start from a small aspect and narrow down our focus. So here we chose to start from uh, optimized product pricing, specifically on discount optimization. So in this environment or in this workflow, you can find an agent on the left-hand side. We name it just discount agent. Namely, it will provide uh, discount events for each product. And we call it an action to inform the retail environment. And once the environment receives that action, you can imagine that, for example, uh, the retailer would put on the price stack uh, on the rack and say such and such product will have like a 10% off. That could be an example. And once the retail environment receives that, we'll have these two components do the forecasting to tell how will each customer reacts to such an action. Um, so to get that result, we specifically have two components. The first one is the customer visit model, which tell us if the customer will visit the store or not according to their loyalty preference. So for example, we could have some feature like how frequent the customer will visit the store or how much money they usually spend uh, per visit and such and such. And once we have this uh, prediction, we'll basically know, yes, they'll visit the store or no, they will not. And we only pursue it, uh, pr proceed with the case when they visit the store, right? And the next step would be, okay, now they visit the store, then how many units of products they purchase? So this question would be infected by uh, product price, promotion events, and customer preference, and so on. So in the environment here, uh, each component could be uh, built in a probabilistic manner. Um, and after this retail, uh, after the environment, uh, produce some like response to the action, to the discount action. It will actually put, um, how to say, re resend the observation back to the discount agent and tell how the customer actually behaves that. And we could also know some aggregated uh, number, for example, like the total uh, rewards that the retailer earned. And then we could formulate such a like a flow uh, repeatedly such that we could run the simulation uh, uh, again and again. Cool. I kind of want to stop here for, for some uh, for a little bit to see if there's any questions. Um, yeah, so, um, hey, hi, sorry, I need to be on video. Okay, so one thing that, uh, uh, okay, it's an anonymous attendee, but one thing that they asked is, uh, in the uh, in the diagram that you see right now, are we uh, inputting the data live into the prediction system? Yeah, uh, I feel it really depends on the need. Of course, uh, if we have the live data and have the algorithm to integrate into the like the system and prompt the strategy uh, or the optimal strategy according to the live data, that would be ideal. But also that will involve a lot of like technical um, uh, developing, not just on the uh, um, policy optimization, but also involve some infrastructure development. So basically usually like the more that we want to integrate with like live data and the more uh, technical difficulty, difficulty we'll have. 
but yes, that's uh, we could we could integrate live data into the system. So one follow up question, and I think you already touched on that, is when we are working with real time predictions, right? So say with live data. Uh, we do need to consider the scalability aspect of it, right? So, uh, in, do you have a suggestion? Like, uh, do you suggest uh, using real-time analysis uh, uh, as a preference? Or would you always like to go for batch if you had the choice? Mm -hmm. uh, it actually kind of reminds me of like a discussion about whether to pick the online uh, update, the online learning part, which, yeah, uh, we kind of make some decision that go back to the batch learning because like that's the data set we have like a full control of and do not really need to worry more about like how to integrate the live data uh, to the current stream. Uh, but I would say, yes, for the scalability side, I would always suggest to first verify some like uh, your funding using the batch data and see if and then do some exploration if that still holds true on the online but, uh, the online data part. Okay, yeah. Uh, while we were talking, there's one more question that Natalie posted. Uh, I don't know if uh, that will take a lot of time. In that case, you can choose to uh, answer it offline as well, Hugh. So her question is, uh, the two models that we are seeing over here, that is the customer visit model and the demand model, uh, how do we train them? Like if we can go a little deeper into it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's such a good question to connect to the next page. Uh, but I should admit that just uh, try to save a little bit of time to the interactive uh, code example. I will not try to touch much about the customer vision model, but focus on the demand model today and hope this could serve some like a, a example. And it's relative like a uh, easier to have your own customer model, customer visit model if we have like an example of a similar one. Uh, but that's such a good question for the next page, which I just about to tell uh, some reference paper that we uh, that we take a look at to construct the demand model. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's go ahead with it. Nice. Um, so usually like once we have the demand model, we'll have some like evaluation matrix, like for the deterministic word supervised learning, we may have like the accuracy, uh, the MAPE uh, and vice versa. And in the probabilistic uh, programming for a uh, kind of scenario, or in our use case, we not only want that MAPE or the accuracy matrix to be performed well, but also want the distribution to fit the well. And that's actually the difficulty come in. Uh, because our overall demand queue is quite sparse. If you like uh, look at a purchase like per customer uh, in let's say uh, the a customer visit the store every week and that still have some zeros that the customer will not purchase some of uh, products according to their preferences. So that's the uh, some difficulty we encounter and here we ref refer uh, we refer to a paper modeling consumer preferences and price sensitivities uh, from large scale large scale grocery shopping transaction logs uh, this paper and um, I attached the link down below the slide so feel free to check more for more details but I'll try to summary the key idea here um, just to save a little bit of time and the other here wants to decompose the customer purchase decision step by step. So let's use the left hand side example here. Just assuming we're all customer visit visiting the store and just somehow stop by the uh, refrigerated cabinet and just thinking about, we just somehow thinking about the same question. Are we going to buy or get organic milk? So according to some preferences like uh, between milk or plant-based milk or even just like habit of not consuming milk, we may made a decision, right? And if yes, well then step to the next step. Like we decide to buy organic milk, or organic milk but which product to purchase? Um, we may made a decision according to like manufacturer, like a uh, product expiration, expiration date and even the batch size and et cetera. And let's say we finally decide which product to purchase. And the final 
question would be how many units to purchase. This answer might be influenced by like household size, uh, probably maybe just one box of milk is pretty much for me myself and just buy one. So you can see that this is like a, a process that each step is kind of dependent on the step before. Thus, uh, we could obtain like a conditional relationship here. So using a Bayesian, a uh, relative simple Bayesian network to represent the process, we could have first step as the category preferences uh, noted at probability of C. And then we'll have the conditional uh, product preferences, which is like the probability of the B given that we chose to purchase category C, right? And the third step would be the conditional quantity preferences, which is the probability of Q, the quantity that we purchase, given the first two step, the category and the product preferences, right? And to um, have the joint distribution, which is simply, uh, simply times these three components together and form this uh, formula four. Cool. And the ideal outcome of such a modeling approach is to derive the demand distribution, this joint distribution that could capture the sparsity of our overall demand and accurately represents such a decision process. And that's exactly the place, the probability part we found uh, the probabilistic programming could be a strong fit. Nice. Um, so Lots then jumped to the demo was, uh, how, how to say, like really implement this uh, example. Cool. Let's say, I'm sh not sure if we're seeing the notebook, I'm sure. I'm just going to reshare it. Yeah. Sounds great. Um, I, the notebook kind of starting from like a, quick overview of the concept of probabilistic programming and the model. Uh, I will not really go through that because we already covered that, but uh, feel free to kind of use that as a hint when you uh, revisit the link. And we'll share the collab link uh, after this. Um, for this uh, code example, I should also say uh, I major, uh, mainly use the first step the probability of category preferences as the example, because like every other two step is pretty much similar to the uh, process, as long as we prepare the input data separately. Um, and those then could be regarded as like an independent uh, modeling approaches. And the way that you connect uh, these three steps together is by this formula here. It's just like a kind of reiteration of formula four we just introduced. Cool. And with that being said, we're going to model the category choice, which is saying how, um, what's the purchase probability of one customer have uh, on a specific category. Um, I prepare like a small sample data set for this workshop so that we have a full control of the example and co better compare the learned result. So here's some hyper uh, metadata of the data sets that we have two categories. It's a simplified example, of course. And uh, we have a hundred of customers uh, to generate a training data set. And for each combination of category and customer, we're generate 40 samples. So that means um, we're kind of track each customer once a month for three years straight in real scenario and just ask them, uh, in, in your current visit, are you going to buy such and such category of product, right? Cool. And I define some helper methods ahead. And this part is basically just uh, uh, call the helper methods and generate a synthetic data set, which will have this uh, purchase probability data frame here. So let's take a look at this sample. We have customer ID the category uh, level as a string tie and the gender. Here I use like one representing male and a negative one representing female. Uh, loyalty score here, as well as the purchase probability. So just interpret 
for example, the first two lines, it means we have a customer uh, zero uh, who uh, usually has a loyalty score of 1.68 on the Razor uh, product and he's a uh, mill customer and thus the prob purchase probability is 0. Uh, 0.35. And similarly, on the second row, the same customer will have a purchase probability of 0. 0.19 on foundation-related products, like the makeup foundation. Cool. Um, so I kind of set the data to have the, the loyalty score is the higher, the better, mainly the higher the loyalty score, the uh, customer will prefer the category more. Cool. And here's also a volume plot to uh, visualize the distribution or visualize the uh, distribution of purchase problem a little bit. So here we can see uh, the we want to capture the fact that the female customer will have a larger probability to purchase foundation related product while the male customer will have larger probability to purchase razor related products. So just quickly add a short uh, disclaimer that the data is like generated only for the uh, small example and uh, is not directly extracted from any, uh, any uh, data set we could find in the real life. Let's say now we have the probability, right? But uh, from the observation side, we this probability probability is actually hidden to the uh, analyst, right? Um, and what we actually could observe is the purchase decision. It's a binary outcome that will have zero or one, like zero to be not purchased, and one is purchased. Cool. And that's our training data set. Um, and the question we're studying is that, uh, let's say we know this kind of feature and we want to tell whether the customer will purchase or not. Yeah, good about the problem setup. Let's then go to the model structure here. And um, here, I specifically use Bayesian hierarchical linear regression. And for example, uh, mostly because in this example, I could also introduce some uh, Wally phrases that, um, uh, phrases that actually use NumPyro and some uh, really useful one. Uh, so hopefully bear with me a little bit to uh, understand the model a little bit. I saw, kind of a uh, quick question about how did you determine the purchase probability? Uh, so it's more like a kind of Bayesian belief is like um, given my certain like a context, maybe I have some uh, preference on milk or no, and depending on my needs, I have some uh, certain of degree of like confidence that I will purchase the milk or not. And it's, a kind of similar analogy is like you could ask like what's the probability like today is rainy and it, it will not really have that observation it or it will it will not have that kind of observation being verified after the events really happen and there's another question that if we want to collect such a data in real life where we do get purchase probability. And that's such a good question is that I want to clarify that we're using this observation, the purchase decision, like the binary outcome to be the training data set. Uh, and the place that I show the purchase probability is mainly to uh, kind of visualize the ground truth. And that's the that's the the stats is from the synthetic data sets uh, that the one that we want to learn uh, against. And that's the one we want to, how to say, recover. But in the training data set, we'll just use zero or one, which uh, we could observe from a uh, real world, right? Nice. And last then have the model being explained. Um, I hear, is a Bayesian uh, linear regression one 
uh, a Bayesian hierarchy, hierarchical linear regression model to estimate the purchase probability. Um, I kind of want, want to make a quick analogy to the simplest possible linear regression, not the hierarchical one. That uh, the linear regression, the simplest linear regression, would assume all probability curve have the same alphas, have the same uh, coefficients. However, we here add a little bit variation on the betas part uh, and assume that all betas are different across customers, but they share some similarity, for example, like sampling from the same distribution. And notice that I also have alpha and alpha two uh, just show as like kind of global coefficient that without any subscription, but the beta here is subscribed uh, with customer U, right? And then uh, once we have the score here, we'll pass the score to a sigmoid function to turn the score to be range between zero and one, such that we could interpret it uh, as a probability. And the observation, the binary observation, is sample from a Bernoulli distribution, right? And there's kind of a concept called like pooled model, which could be compatible to the case of the simplest linear regression model, while we could have an like unpooled model where there are completely different probability curves for each customer for each category. Well, our model here uh, sits kind of in the middle of the spectrum. Uh, that's also uh, proposed by the original paper that I shared earlier. And in that original paper, they also use uh, some term to refer to the coefficients. Uh, for those terms which share the same coefficient across all groups like the alpha, they call it global effect. And for betas, uh, we call it either category effect or customer effect according to the partition group. And here I also attach a DAG of some factor that will influence the model. So again, I use the light green here to represent the global effect and the dark green here to represent the customer, uh, the beta U here. So that's could help, hope that could help uh, to dis distinguish a little bit on the uh, way that we generate the coefficients. And also I kind of want to highlight because the beta U, the beta here is subscribed by U. Uh, that means the beta here will in the will get a beta in the shape of N customers. Cool. And the next question would be how would we define alpha and betas? And I kind of want to kind of revisit the Bayesian. Uh, theorem a little bit, which is basically have the prior, oh, like say the question we're actually estimate or the alpha that we estimate is the posterior. And we need to define some prior uh, to start the simulation, right? And our prior belief is uh, the alpha, both alpha and beta is sample from a normal distribution, but with different mean and standard deviation. And for the alpha, the global effects, we have a pretty only one single mu and uh, standard deviation shared by all the customer and category. So uh, the alpha one here is generated from a normal distribution with mean of mu alpha and standard deviation of alpha. While the beta here, uh, we need to generate a coefficient matrix uh, with the shape of n customer. And for each individual beta, it has its own mu and sigma. And that's the reason why we have both the u here subscript, uh, both the mu beta subscript with u as well. And once we have the alpha and beta, we'll integrate it and use the formula above to compute the probability of ui. And that would be a probability matrix with a dimension of number of customer and number of category. And once we have that, we could pass to the Bernoulli distribution to actually generate a category purchase choice. And that's basically what we believe the model should be like. Yep, cool. And what I'm going to do next is split the screen a little bit such that we could have the uh, 
graph on the side and then let's move on to the actual the NumPy row example and how we actually implement this um implement such a like a category choice decision model um I'll try to uh slow down a little bit and to explain line by line so please bear with me if any material is like kind of sounds familiar to you um so let's say I claim a kind of descriptive name about the model which is called category choice and this uh, model accepts the x the global effect feature which is the one that pair with alphas and the category effect feature which the one paired with betas and depending on if we want to do the inference or uh, kind of generate some samples, we could pass the Y or not. So in this case, I just default it to be now. So inside the model, the first step would be read some dimension of uh, read the shape of the input data. So we have N samples, which is 40 in our case, and customer, that would be 100, and N, can, N category, that would be two. Uh, we have like two global features, uh, which is the gender and uh, let me actually pull up a little bit, which is the gender and loyalty score. And we have the category uh, effect feature just as an intercept. So trying to not to uh, complex, uh, complicate the question too much. Um, yeah, so once we have those number ready, we could then start to generate the uh, prior of the uh, coefficients. So starting from the alpha here, because it's shared across by all the customer and categories. According to the uh, like the assumption, we might generate the alpha from a normal distribution. But first, we need to determine the mu and sigma, right? So here, I still uh, generate the mu from a normal distribution. And that the way that we could apply that uh, or implement it using NumPyro is leverage the use of a sample method that they already have, and then specify the generation distribution. Here, I put it to be a normal distribution. So you can find extensive collection of other distribution in the distribution module uh, in NumPyro. So feel free to also try a uh, different kind of generative uh, distribution if you're interested in. Okay, once we have the normal distribution, again, we need to define the mean and the standard deviation, right? And here, I because we need like two global features, I just generate them uh, all at once, where I assume that is generated from a standard normal. And the way that I initialize the zeros here is using the jacks. Uh, JAX is a, a library that's kind of quite similar. The syntax is quite similar to NumPy, but it performs super well when it comes to like GPU related uh, training works uh, or it's kind of like tackle super fast when it comes to like, yeah, GPU related works. And if you want to make an analogy to the uh, syntax in NumPy, that'll be mp.0s and the, the number of the global features. So if you're familiar with NumPy, it's relative similar uh, and relative easier to read through the documentation of JAX. Cool. And similar with the standard deviation, I just uh, initialized to be a array of ones. And after calling the sample, we'll receive an alpha mu with the shape of two. And that would be our alpha mu for uh, the global feature. And similar for the standard deviation is quite uh, probably exactly the same, but the difference is that uh, we changed the normal distribution to half normal just because we want the standard deviation to be always positive. Cool. And once we have that, we're good to go to generate the alpha, which is Again, similar to generate the normal distribution with the alpha mu that we just have and the alpha sigma that we just generate. Cool. So we can imagine the alpha here is a JAX array. And the next step is like we could compute the global effect by matrix multiplication. 
And again, the syntax is relatively similar to the NumPy one, which is just not a uh, NumPy matrix multiplication about of the X global effect feature and the alpha. Cool. Sounds great. And that's basically the part on the left here. And we already compute the uh, global effect. And then let's dive into the right hand side here, the beta part. This is a, a little bit kind of a little bit more concept added into the process because here you can see we add a rectangle uh, representing a for loop uh, across the customer axis. And that's the place I also want to introduce a concept supported by NumPyro, which is the plate. And the plate restricts the dimension of the uh, coefficient or any array that we use NumPyro to generate. And it's essentially a for loop, but it also kind of deal with the independence relationship between the sample generation across this dimension. So the really good idea is that it's basically guaranteed that each beta u is uh, generated dependently, uh, independently uh, with each other. Cool. So that means we are defining some plates. Uh, one is across the dimension of customer and one is across the dimension of uh, the category feature. And notice that we're generating like beta u, right? So that means the beta U is per customer and per category effect, uh, uh, category feature. So that will have, we'll have like a, a coefficient matrix with the shape of a hundred with the customer, number of customer and one, which is the number of category feature. Yeah. But once you construct this for loop uh, using a waste statement uh, to passing these two plates, everything inside a block is pretty much similar to the previous uh, way that we generate alpha, is that you specify the generating distribution and give a name and just pass it to the numpyro.sample and it would generate a uh, JAX array for you. So similarly, we'll, have, we'll generate beta mu, beta sigma, and then finally the beta. And here I adjust the shape of the beta array such that we could do the matrix multiplication with the category effect. Uh, and that's the way that we compute a category effect and could squish to the shape that we could directly add it to the global effect. So kind of a quick recap, we're done the alpha, or we're done the beta, done with the betas. And now let's finally compute the probability, the purchase probability. Cool. And um, it's basically just adding the global effect and category effect together, right? To get a score and then pass to a, sigma, a sigmoid transforming, transformer to get uh, the purchase probability to be arranged between zero and one. And when, once we have that, we could pass this probability matrix to the Bernoulli distribution to generate the uh, binomial outcome. Sorry, not the binomial, it's actually the binary outcome, just to clarify. Yep. That's basically is on the model definition and hopes so uh, following on the logic. Uh, I want to kind of highlight the advantage of using NumPyro is that you do not really need to be like an expert in uh, poster estimation because they already support uh, tons of tools uh, to do the simulation for you. Uh, so here I just used a uh, uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo simulation here, but the library import uh, includes more to explore like stochastic variational inference uh, in Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and so on. And they're also like really nice helper methods to printing the report of the simulation and just tell you uh, whether the simulation, uh, the estimation converged or not. So I would not really cover much about this part. It's basically just kind of copy the tutorial that provided by the documentation, how to run the simulation. But I kind of want to show the learning result, uh, the trace plots that we learned the parameters. 
So here we're basically saying the uh, trace plot is pretty much smooth and uh, converge to the uh, converge to some value the mean here. And we could also have like a statement to check if the uh, Monte Carlo simulation status is converging. So here I basically checking every status is converge indeed. Cool. So that's a good sign that we could keep checking the learned parameter and see how uh, how well we're learning by comparing with the real results. And there's two ways. Uh, if you know about your model, you could just repeat the calculation again by do the uh, by input the uh, parameter or the coefficient into your Bayesian hierarchical linear regression model. And that's how uh, that's the number I got. So basically, we recover a purchase probability for each customer. And I know it's not quite straightforward to visualize it. So here is a volume plot with the comparison between the true value and the prediction value. So you can see the learned the learned distribution is pretty much okay to capture the mean of the distribution, but they usually looks like wider than the actual probability. And there's some like reason uh, or kind of inspection that you could check. Like the first one is the model miss specification. Like if the model used to fit the data is not a good one for the underlying distribution. Like you may define a you may kind of check with different priors and check if your model assumption just valid. And if it's not, the result learned, uh, the resulting distribution may be wider uh, than the true or uh, narrower than the true distribution, will not capture the real shape. And second, there could also be like sampling error. Like if the number of samples used to estimate the learned distribution is too small, uh, the resulting distribution may be wider than the true distribution due to sampling error. And the third one is, of course, we also need to take um, the parameter uncertainty into consideration. So in Bayesian inference, the learned distribution is still like a posterior distribution that takes into account both the likelihood and the prior distribution. And the width of the learned distribution reflects the uncertainty in those models and in the model parameters. So if there's like a significant uncertainty in the parameters, uh, the resulting the, the learned distribution may be wider than the original one. So that could be some aspect that we could check after uh, getting the first insights. And also I want to spend a little bit of time to kind of check another way to do the inference is directly leverage the posterior samples uh, where we construct a predict objects and just have the uh, prob prob uh, purchase probability mean from the uh, posterior samples. And I create a helper methods to do the in uh, to pull out the purchase probability and write a QQ plot a QQ plot uh, against the true value. So in this example, we could see uh, the dots, uh, most of the dots just lying uh, across a diagonal line, which is a good sign that um, which is a good sign that we learn where approximate the right uh, coefficient. Yeah, that's basically the end of the code uh, example, but I also attach more uh, documentation. I feel like super helpful or the example, I feel uh, helpful when I gather this material as well as uh, the paper reference down below. Yeah, and hope you guys enjoy. And uh, I will just stay to answer if there's any question. Thank you so much, you, for delivering such an important workshop. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a very defeating wrap to an equally invigorating session that we had today. So we have quite a few questions for you. Uh, I'm going to uh, start right at the top. Uh, so I think this was better left in the end. Uh, so Shruti asked that, how do we decide on priors, say, for a particular uh, data set, given the problem? And what if we don't know, like, what if we don't have enough data to uh, generate a more sensible prior? Mm -hmm. um, I would say, like, 
I actually, there's some like kind of analysis or the prior analysis according to the need. Like for example, like we could ask like why we just choose Bernoulli distribution as the generated uh, uh, way to construct, uh, to turn the purchase probability to the actual observations. So that could be like a kind of daily observation that if we have that belief, it's just either zero or one, that's uh, to create that discrete uh, outcome. And the Bernoulli distribution seems like a good fit. And for example, we, in the kind of theory of probability class, we may encounter example of like the wait time uh, in a bus station and there have just like Poisson distribution. So there's just extensive like kind of uh, research work or any tutorial like describing some classical events. But I should say that would, could be your like the first reference to choose the right prior if you do not have enough uh, analysis, uh, if you do not have enough data for the analysis. And in that case, in certain cases, a frequentist approach might make more sense, uh, right to you? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, so we have another question, which is uh, kind of along the similar lines. Uh, uh, Samuel asking, how do you choose the probability distribution for the Bayesian hierarchical linear regression? Uh, similar stuff, uh, I'm assuming as the prior, but how and how much sensibility of the category purchase choices could you expect from different probability distributions? Mm -hmm. um, I should also say that uh, any of kind of distribution here is like, by assumption, by our model assumption. So feel free to just like try any others if you like uh, find another good fit. So maybe this like category choice is the one that would do not have much argument just because the nature of the binary outcome. But if we dive into the second step, like the, actually the third step, the quantity of purchase, is actually have more discussion space that maybe the quantity distribution will follow a normal distribution or like a, a Poisson distribution or any kind of uh, uh, tail inflated distribution. So that's actually the interesting part that you have the freedom to choose whatever distribution you like. And I always suggest so just pair your choice of distribution with like an evaluation toolkit to compare if that's captured the true uh, uh, the true observation or the uh, trend that you could observe from the data set. Thank you so much, Yu. Uh, maybe one last question from Joy. I think I had it, where did it go? Uh, yeah, so uh, coming down to the choice of hyperparameters, is it a general practice in the real world cases to initialize alpha using standard normal distribution? I see. Um, um, I feel that's also have like a more extensive reading about how to decide the prior, mm -hmm. but from my limited experience, like normal distribution would be my first trial, but also depending on like your, the, how to say the, uh, some characteristic of your posterior distribution, you may also find like a conjugate uh, prior will also help. So that really kind of, the answer really differs uh, from case to case. All right, so I think that is all the questions that we had for you right now. Thank you so much again for explaining them in such detail and for the very, very interesting presentation.